Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Sometimes we're just right. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this that if you've watched our show throughout the last year, you've covered the James Comey situation over the email scandals and his testimony before Congress, and the FBI director is now the former FBI director for a lot of the same reasons that we told you about almost a year ago. In the last few weeks, we've been running a series on the history of U.S. involvement in the Middle East. We are suspending that series for one episode. We will uh, try to get back on track with that because we do want to bring that to a conclusion. Just with the, uh, with the firing of FBI Director Comey, there's just a lot of stuff that we really feel the need to get through, so we're going to be focusing on that for this hour. So as we go right on into our Prager University segment, please keep this in the forefront of your mind. One question, can you trust the press? Let's see what Prager U has to say. Liberal or conservative, male or female, young or old, Americans love to bash the news media. Once among the nation's most trusted institutions, the news media have fallen from grace. According to Gallup, even as recently as 2000, a majority of Americans trusted the press. By 2015, it had fallen to 40%, and lower than that, 36% among those 18 to 49. It's hard to see how this decline will be reversed. The industry has become politically polarized, and in the highly competitive age of multiple 24-hour cable news channels and the internet, it's under severe financial pressure. And this compounds an even deeper problem, failing journalistic standards. In the 1950s, the media universe consisted mainly of a few national television broadcast networks and local TV and radio stations, most of which got much of their news from major wire services in the nation's large newspapers. Most journalists were committed to producing objective journalism, fact-based stories independent of the government and of political parties. A reporter's job was to report, not offer opinion or advocate. Presented with the facts, it was up to readers to make their own judgments about news events. Opinions were supposed to be confined to editorial and op-ed pages. That world no longer exists. This lack of objectivity and the decline of standards is one reason, though not the only one, why newspapers and news magazines are a declining industry. According to Pew Research, print revenue from newspaper sales has declined from $47 billion in 2006 to $16 billion in 2014. Digital sales haven't come close to making up the difference. Most papers have been forced to cut operating expenses, slash staff, and close bureaus, overseas in particular. Ironically, there are more stories than ever to cover, and fewer staff than ever to cover them. This lack of information from professional journalists has been filled by a new source, social media and the blogosphere. When the Iraq War, which I covered for the New York Times, began in 2003, there were roughly 100,000 bloggers. Only a few years later, there were an estimated 27 million. The Internet, as a news source, has obvious pluses and minuses. On the plus side is that information is spread widely and instantly. The minuses have to do with the fact that the quality of reporting varies dramatically. It's not easy to separate the wheat from the chaff. Furthermore, many sites, including mainstream sites, have abandoned traditional journalistic practices and standards in search of more and more eyeballs. Objectivity, once the gold standard of reporting, is now often seen as old-fashioned, a ratings loser. When success is measured mainly in terms of clicks, the outrageous beats the sober just about every time. Inserting opinion, even in the middle of a news story, is a way in which journalists can distinguish themselves. And in mainstream media outlets, those opinions overwhelmingly tend to be liberal. This might not be so bad if journalists acknowledged their bias. 
but they almost never do. Yet the bias is obvious. According to a 2014 study by two Indiana University professors, reporters who identify as Democrats outnumber those who identify as Republicans by 4 to 1, 28 percent to 7 percent. The remaining 65 percent call themselves independent, but based on my long experience as a reporter, this is a fiction. That is, many reporters like to describe themselves as independent, but they're not. Not really. By any fair measure, this group is overwhelmingly on the political left. The obvious liberal bias has only served to push conservative readers to those sources that cater to conservative themes, further polarizing the media landscape. And unable to attract conservatives, the mainstream media have chosen to double down on views and themes that appeal to their liberal constituency. To give just one example, when Fox News broke a story in January 2016 about the discovery of top-secret intelligence on the private email server that Hillary Clinton used while Secretary of State, classified information which she had denied ever having sent or received, the New York Times buried this news story deep inside the paper. A decline in reporting standards, a decline in revenue, an increase in bias have made many wary of the people who provide them with their news. A certain amount of skepticism is a healthy thing, but a thriving democracy depends on a dynamic and free press. As much as people may like to bash the media, most people would far prefer to trust it. I'm Judith Miller, contributing editor of City Journal for Prager University. So there you have it. Can you trust the press? I'll tell you this, we are one of those groups that are filling the void. We are. I've said it before, I will say it again, my political affiliation is center-right. I'm not going to make any bones about that. I tend towards the center. I try to look at the good and the bad in both political parties. The biggest thing is we try to find out what's right and what is true and what is correct and what is accurate. Politically, I lean more toward the right than I do the left, but I'm not really hard to either side. I am still hover more towards the center. I will tell you my bias right up front. Unlike a uh, certain ABC correspondent, I believe he's with ABC, uh, his first name is George, and the last one is a Greek name, uh, Stephanopoulos, who used to work for President Bill Clinton, both on the campaign side and the official side, and then goes to ABC and pretends he's objective and fair and balanced, when we all know that he is far hard to the left. He refuses to admit that publicly, even though he's made contributions to the Clinton Family Foundation. Now, keep that in mind when we go through this discussion, and not so much for, for this program, but when you watch this out and about and read it in the newspaper about the James Comey firing, um, because there is a huge bias out there. Now, this is the statement that was released on May 9th from the press secretary for the White House. Today, President Donald J. Trump informed FBI Director James Comey that he has been terminated and removed from office. President Trump acted based on the clear recommendations of both Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Quote, the FBI is one of our nation's most cherished and respected institutions and today will mark a new beginning for our crown jewel of law enforcement, said President Trump. A search for a new permanent FBI director will begin immediately. And then here is the letter from President Trump to Director Comey, May 9th. Dear Director Comey, I have received the attached letters from the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General of the United States recommending your dismissal as the Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I have accepted their recommendation and you are hereby terminated and removed from office effective immediately. While I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation, I nevertheless concur with the judgment of the Department of Justice that you are not able to effectively lead the Bureau. It is essential that we find new leadership for the FBI that restores public trust and confidence in its vital law enforcement mission. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Donald J. Trump, 
So that was the letter that was sent to uh, Comey's office in Washington. Uh, Director Comey was actually in California and had read about his termination uh, on the TV when he was giving a speech. Uh, that's quite an interesting uh, tidbit in and of itself. But Comey's been replaced. And right now, Andrew McCabe is the acting FBI director until a uh, permanent replacement can be found. So now, we're going to go back in time. Uh, a few years, we're going to bring you up to date. This is the unraveling of director James Comey. And it starts with what he had to say September 4th, 2013, when he was introduced by President Barack Obama as the new FBI director replacing then-retired uh, Robert um, Mueller. I, James B. Comey, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations thank you I'll tell you I interviewed a number of extraordinary candidates for this job all with sterling credentials but what gave me confidence that this was the right man for the job. Now, it wasn't his degrees and it wasn't his resume. It was in talking to him and seeing his amazing family, a sense that this is somebody who knows what's right and what's wrong and is willing to act on that basis every single day. And that's why I'm so grateful that he signed up to serve again. Your mission keeps expanding because the nature of the threats are always changing. Unfortunately, the resources allotted to that mission has been reduced by sequestration. I'll keep fighting for those resources because our country asks and expects a lot from you, and we should make sure you've got the resources you need to do the job, especially when many of your colleagues put their lives on the line on a daily basis, all to serve and protect our fellow citizens. The least we can do is make sure you've got the resources for it and that your operations are not disrupted because of politics in this town. The FBI's reputation for integrity is a gift given to every new employee by those who went before. But it is a gift that must be protected and earned every single day. We protect that gift by making mistakes and admitting them, by making promises and keeping them, and by realizing that nothing, no case, no source, no fear of embarrassment is worth jeopardizing the gift of integrity. So nothing is worth jeopardizing the gift of integrity. That was newly sworn in FBI Director James Comey in 2013. Now, one of the big crusades that the FBI Director has been on has been uh, cell phone encryptions and yes he does have a certain point about it being harder to be able to you know get wiretaps and access data in a law enforcement regard that is true but this if you recall a couple of years ago we're going to go to October 16th 2014 and here is our FBI director talking about encryption being a technical failure in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, the prevailing view is that the government is sweeping up all of our communications. That is not true. And unfortunately, the idea that the government has access to all communications at all times has extended even more unfairly to law enforcement. 
that is working to obtain individual warrants approved by judges to intercept the communications of suspected criminals. Some believe that law enforcement, and especially the FBI, has these phenomenal capabilities to access any information at any time, that we can get what we want, when we want it, by flipping a switch. That is the product of too much television. It frustrates me because I want people to understand that law enforcement needs to be able to access communications and information in a lawful way to bring people to justice. Encryption is nothing new, but the challenge to law enforcement and national security officials is markedly worse with recent default encryption settings and encrypted devices and networks, all in the name of increased security and privacy. For example, with Apple's new operating system, the information stored on many iPhones and other Apple devices will be encrypted by default. Shortly after Apple's announcement, Google announced plans to follow suit with its Android operating system. This means that the companies themselves will not be able to unlock phones, laptops, and tablets to reveal photos or documents or email or stored texts or recordings in those, doc in those instruments. Look, both companies are run by good people who care deeply about public safety and national security. I know that. And they're responding to a market demand that they perceive. But the place that this is leading us is one that I suggest we should not go without careful thought and debate as a country. Encryption just isn't a technical feature. It's part of a marketing strategy. But it will have very serious consequences for law enforcement and national security agencies at all levels. Sophisticated criminals will come to count on these means of evading detection. It's the equivalent of a closet that can't be opened, a safe deposit box that can't be opened, a safe that can't ever be cracked. And my question uh, to facilitate this, this conversation is, at what cost? We're seeing more and more where we believe significant evidence is on that phone or on that laptop and we can't crack the password. If this becomes the norm, I suggest to you that homicide cases could be stalled, suspects walked free, child exploitation not discovered and prosecuted. Justice may be denied because of a locked phone or an encrypted device. I think all of So what has data encryption have to do with all of this? Something that came up when we find out at what cost. Um, a year, almost a year later, July 8th, 2015, Director Comey also vo continued to voice more concern over data encryption. Let's take a look. Americans care about the same things. There is not a war being fought here. There is, I hope, a conversation among serious people to figure out, is there a way to maximize both? To keep ourselves secure on the internet and as best we can to keep ourselves safe in our streets and our communities. There has always been a crypto discussion but the world has changed in the last two years. Decryption has moved from being something available to something that is the default, both on devices and on data in motion, as you said, Mr. Chairman. The ISIL thread, I think, illustrates the inflection point. As the Deputy Attorney General said, this is not your uh, grandfather's Al-Qaeda. This is a group of people using social media to reach thousands and thousands of followers find the ones who might be interested in committing acts of violence and then moving them to an encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. Our job is to look at a haystack the size of this country for needles that are increasingly invisible to us because of end-to-end -end encryption. We belong to the American people. The tools we have are only tools given to us by the American people through this Congress. I am finding that the tools we are being asked to use are increasingly ineffective in our national security work and in our criminal work. And I think my job is to tell folks about that so we can talk about it. We were. Well, I would actually think that the director's job would be to make sure that the FBI internally can create the technology and the applications so the technology is not outdated. Would that not be about right? I mean, the Department of Defense does that all the time. If, we, if the Department of Defense decides that, hey, listen, we got a problem here, yes, they do have a procurement process to purchase new equipment, but that doesn't mean that they don't develop things in-house. Marine Corps sniper rifles, for instance, where are they manufactured? Quantico, Virginia. The Marines develop their own sniper rifles. And it's developed by Marines for Marines. Uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. You can't tell me that the FBI doesn't do that? 
That's where I think that uh, Director Comey kind of missed the boat. That his responsibility is to make sure that his agency has the tools necessary to fight, not just to go on out and raise awareness. I find it funny. Everybody wants to go out there and raise awareness, but yet nothing's ever done to solve the problem that they're raising the awareness about. Uh, but that's another conversation for another day. So what happened on December 2nd, 2015? Do you remember? Give you a moment. That was 23 days before Christmas, 2015. The San Bernardino terrorist attack. 14 were killed, 22 were wounded. And what did the FBI come out and say? Well, they got an uh, iPhone that we can't crack. It's what the FBI claimed. Personally, I think I might even be able to ho have hooked them up with a few hackers that could have done it for maybe $50,000. Got the same effect. So, when Director Comey asked, at what cost? He actually answered the question. About a million dollars. That's how much it cost. Here's the director. We were able to get into the phone because in an odd way that all the controversy and attention around the litigation I think stimulated a bit of a marketplace around the world, which didn't exist before then, for people to try and figure out could they break into an Apple 5C running iOS 9. And those details matter, obviously, because that's the phone that the terrorists left behind. And as a result of that stimulation, uh, while the litigation was ongoing, we didn't stop trying to figure out whether we could get in, but somebody approached us from outside the government and said, we think we've come up with a solution. And we tested it and tested it and tested it, and then we purchased it. And we were able to, once we knew it would get us into the phone, we were able to withdraw the litigation. And in my view, that's a good reason, good thing for a couple of different reasons. First, we got into the phone, which is a very important part of the investigation. And second, litigation is not a great place to resolve hard values questions that implicate all kinds of things that all of us care about. And, and so it was a, and the emotion and pain around that case was a bit of a distraction, frankly, from a more important conversation that I think we have to have. And so in that sense, it's also good that the litigation was no longer necessary. The investigation obviously continues, but this will be a feature of our work. There'll be other litigation, I'm sure, but it'll be a feature of our work increasingly um, over the months and years to come. So how much did you pay for this software? A lot. Really? More, let's see more than I will make in the remainder of this job, which is seven years and four months, uh, for sure. Wow. Um, and so it's a, uh, but it was, in my view, worth it. He did not last seven years and four months. He lasted uh, one year and about three weeks. Uh, so much for that. But keep this in mind. We have, when we discuss gun control, if you severely restrict and put the severe gun control legislation on gun owners, then pretty soon the only ones available to have guns are going to be criminals because they're not abiding by the law. And right now encryption technology is available worldwide. So if we restrict encryption technology here in the United States, China, Russia, Bangladesh, Turkey, they're going to have all the encryption technology. We won't have anything. Keep that in the back of your mind when you listen to Director Comey speak about encryption. But we are going to be moving on from that because last summer, yes, we have to bring it up, there was an investigation on Hillary Clinton's emails. And FBI Director James Comey on July the 5th came out and made this long press conference essentially outlining the need for an indictment and yet he gave us no charges. So we're just going to show you a very short segment from that press conference. Dallas. In looking back at our investigations into the mishandling or removal of classified information, we cannot find a case that would support bringing criminal charges on these facts. All the cases prosecuted involved some combination of clearly intentional and willful mishandling of classified information or vast quantities of information exposed in such a way as to support an inference of intentional misconduct or indications of disloyalty to the United States or efforts to obstruct justice. We do not see those things here. This is a double-edged sword for Hillary Clinton's and her campaign. 
on one hand, there won't be any criminal charges, but on the other, it, it's a, a completely scathing uh, review by Jim Comey and the FBI. Uh, he said that uh, Clinton used uh, very uh, poor judgment here. That's something that no presidential candidate wants to have attached to him or her. I think all of these things are, are, are more and more examples of, uh, that lead people to think that the Clintons try to play by their own set of rules and that they, they get away with it. This makes it much harder for Hillary Clinton to make the trust argument. And the irony is that this is all coming hours before Barack Obama, the president, uh, her one-time campaign foe, is, is traveling with her to essentially make that argument, that she is the trustworthy candidate here, the person who we should turn the, the levers of power over to in the White House. Um, so it's going to be hard. And, and, and a big problem for Hillary is that this plays right into the hand, the argument that Donald Trump has been making. He's been saying that the system is rigged and you can't trust a Democratic administration to, to properly investigate someone like Hillary Clinton. I don't think that, uh, that Hillary Clinton is, is forever damaged by this and, and has no chance of, of winning the White House. I mean, battleground polls still show her ahead of Trump in a lot of the states that matter. Uh, Trump has very high negatives of his own. I think this is just going to be um, part of the discussion going forward. It's going to be hard for voters to just somehow separate this investigation out when they're making this decision. This is going to be part of the, the calculation. Uh so I want to read from Attorney General Jeff Sessions in his letter from May 9th to President Trump. Dear Mr. President, as Attorney General, I'm committed to a high level of discipline, integrity, and the rule of law to the Department of Justice an institution that I deeply respect. Based on my evaluation and for the reasons expressed by the Deputy Attorney General in the attached memorandum, I have, I have concluded that a fresh start is needed at the, at the leadership of the FBI. It is essential that this Department of Justice clearly reaffirm its commitment to long-standing principles that ensure the integrity and fairness of federal investigations and prosecutions. The director of the FBI must be someone who follows faithfully the rules and principles of the Department of Justice and who sets the right example for our law enforcement officials and others in the department. Therefore, I must recommend that you remove Director James B. Comey Jr. and identify an experienced and qualified individual to lead the great men and women of the FBI. And we will actually get into the Deputy Attorney General's memorandum in just a little bit. But really, this is kind of what it stems from. And this is what got the Republicans all up in an ire because the FBI director, to my knowledge and I think to the knowledge of a lot of people on Capitol Hill, his job is just to prosecute the investigation. It is not to determine whether or not charges need to be pressed. That's up to the Attorney General and other and U.S. attorneys. There was actually a, a U.S. attorney, I think in New York, who was willing to take on the case, yet Director Comey said no reasonable prosecutor will take up this case, so we're not recommending charges. But that was outside of the purview of what the investigative unit does. Take a look at a local police force. If you break into a house and the neighbor calls the police, the police come over there while you are still there, they have some evidence, whether or not you have intent or not, that you know, notwithstanding. But then the police, it's not, you know, if you're caught, they, they charge you. But it's the prosecution, it's the county attorney who determines whether or not those charges are going to go to court or not. And so for the head of the FBI to say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to read you this long 30-minute indictment and then we're not going to press charges upset so many Republicans across this country for the simple reason that there is enough there. There's enough there to at least bring in a grand jury. There was enough information there to at least take a closer look at charges. The, the thing that Comey should have done is said, hey, as the uh, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, we have concluded our investigation and we have turned all of our notes and all of our reports over to the attorney general or to a U.S. attorney, and it will be up to them to determine charges. And he could have had two minutes worth of FaceTime on the cameras, and that would have been it. But no, he reads out practically a whole indictment 
and then says, no, we're not going to do anything with it. So that rankled half the country. And so what happened next? The next day, July 6th, the GOP made the decision to investigate the FBI on emails. Here's Speaker Paul Ryan. Um, I think um, the DNI, Clapper, should, should, should deny Hillary Clinton access to classified information during this campaign, given how she so recklessly handled classified information. That's point one. Point two, uh, Director Comey's presentation shredded the claims that Secretary Clinton made throughout the year with respect to this issue. He, 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 he laid out a case how the things she had been saying she had or had not done were false. So we have seen nothing but stonewalling and dishonesty from Secretary Clinton on this issue, and that means there are a lot more questions that need to be answered. I've just got to say, my, my, from my own experience, um, you get access to deeply classified material um, once you leave the convention as the nominee uh, on a regular basis. Uh, it's part of a transition government. Um, with, with no indictment occurring but a, a discussion or a call for administrative action, I think it's the least we can do given how she was so reckless in handling classified material and sending classified information on unsecure servers. So look, I think that's something that the, the administration should do on its own, um, but we'll look into seeing if that's something we can do as well. With special prosecutor, is that necessary? Well, we'll, we'll we, we, we're not going to foreclose any option. It seems to a lot of And then here is the day after that, July 7th. Director Comey spoke in front of a uh, session of Congress regarding the email probe of us that the average Joe, the average American, that if they had done what you laid out in your statement, that they'd be in handcuffs. And they might be on their way to jail, and they probably should. And I think there is a legitimate concern that there is a double standard. Um, if your name isn't Clinton, or you're not part of the powerful elite, that Lady Justice will act differently. I believe this investigation was conducted consistent with the highest traditions of the FBI. Our folks did it in an apolitical and professional way, including our recommendation as to the appropriate resolution of this case. I see evidence of great carelessness, but I do not see evidence that is sufficient to establish that Secretary Clinton or those with whom she was corresponding both talked about classified information on email and knew when they did it, they were doing something that was against the law. Right? So given that assessment of the facts, my understanding of the law, my conclusion was and remains, no reasonable prosecutor would bring this case. Did the FBI investigate her statements under oath on this topic? Not to my knowledge. I don't think there's been a referral from Congress. Do you need a referral from Congress to investigate her, her Statements under oath? Sure do. You'll have one. <laughs> You'll have one in the, in the next few hours. Um, did Hillary Clinton break the law? In connection with her use of the email server, my judgment is that she did not. When I was in the Air Force, if I sent classified email on the secured network, um, that, that should have been on the secured network uh, through secured email. On the non-secured email system, uh, I could be spending a good 10 years or so at Fort Leavenworth behind bars. But I know I've already covered this, but for the FBI director to come out and say, well, I don't think any charges should be filed, she didn't break the law by having a classified server at, ho at home, that's even worse of a violation of the law than what a U.S. military personnel might be doing just by sending an email on the wrong email account. Uh, that's just to show the difference of opinion between uh, former Director Comey and myself. Now, this is the memo from the uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. I'm going to read this out to you because nobody else does. Uh, it's called Restoring Public Confidence in the FBI. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has... One second here, there we go. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has long been regarded as our nation's premier federal investigative agency. 
Over the past year, however, the FBI's reputation and credibility have suffered substantial damage and has affected the entire Department of Justice. That is deeply troubling to many department employees, veterans, legislators, and citizens. The current FBI director is an articulate and persuasive speaker about leadership and the immutable principles of the Department of Justice. He deserves our appreciation for his public service. As you and I have discussed, however, I cannot defend the director's handling of the conclusion of the investigation of Secretary Clinton's emails, and I do not understand his refusal to accept the nearly universal judgment that he was mistaken. Almost everyone agrees that the director made serious mistakes. It is one of the few issues that unites people of diverse perspectives. Now, mind you, go back to when he talked about making mistakes when he first became the FBI director. And so was that a precursor for what was to come? You be the judge on that. Uh, the director was wrong to usurp the Attorney General's authority on July 5, 2016 and announce his conclusion that the case should be closed without prosecution. It is not the function of the director to make such an announcement. I said that last summer. Uh, reading back from the memo, at most the director should have said the FBI had completed its investigation and presented its findings to federal prosecutors. The director now defends his decision by asserting that he believed Attorney General Loretta Lynch had a conflict, but the FBI director is never empowered to supplant federal prosecutors and assume command of the Justice Department. There is a well-established process for other officials to step in when a conflict requires the recusal of the Attorney General. On July 5th, however, the director announced his own conclusions about the nation's most sensitive criminal investigations without the authorization of duly appointed Justice Department leaders. I said the same thing last summer. Compounding the error, the director ignored other long-standing principles. We do not hold press conferences to release derogatory information about the subject of a declined criminal investigation. Derogatory information sometimes is disclosed in the course of criminal investigations and prosecutions, but we never release it gratuitous, gratuitously. The director laid out his version of the facts for the news media as if it were a closing argument, but without a trial. It is a textbook example of what federal prosecutors and agents are taught not to do. One second here as the memo goes on. In response to questions at a congressional hearing, the director defended his remarks by saying that his goal was to say what is true. What did we do? What did we find? What do we think about it? But the goal of a federal criminal investigation is not to announce our thoughts at a press conference. The goal is to determine whether there is sufficient evidence to justify a federal criminal prosecution, then allow a federal prosecutor who exercises authority delegated by the Attorney General to make a prosecutorial decision, and then, if prosecution is warranted, let the judge and jury determine the facts. We sometimes release information about closed investigations in appropriate ways, but the FBI does not do it uh, sum sponte. Concerning his letter to Congress on October 28th, well, actually, let's go back. Let's go back to uh, video. I'll, I'll come back to this in just a moment here, uh, because now that you got that part of the Deputy Attorney General's uh, memorandum, let's see what the FBI Director said in front of Congress on September 28th, 2016. Last week, the American people learned that Cheryl Mills. Secretary Clinton's longtime confidant and former State Department Chief of Staff, and Heather Samuelson, counsel to Secretary Clinton in the State Department, were granted immunity for production of their laptops. Did the FBI find classified information on either of their computers? I think there were some emails still on the computer that were recovered that were classified, is my recollection. Isn't that a crime? Is what a crime, sir? having classified information on computers that are outside of the server system of the Department of State, unsecured. No, it's certainly something, without knowing more, you couldn't conclude whether it was a crime. You'd have to know what were the circumstances, what was the intention around that. Doesn't it concern you as an investigator that your uh, chiefs in the Justice Department uh, decided to become an immunity-producing machine for many people who uh, would have been very key witnesses should there have been a prosecution? 
I don't, I don't think of it that way. It uh, doesn't strike me there was a lot of immunity issued in this case. There's, I know it's a complicated subject, but there's all different kinds of immunity. There's probably three different kinds that featured in this case. Fairly typical in a complex white collar case, especially as you try and work your way up towards your subject. That I think there are lots of questions people have, which is why I've worked so hard to try and be transparent. There's never been this kind of transparency in a criminal case ever. But because I understand the questions and the importance of it, I've tried. But I hope people will separate two things, questions about facts and judgment from questions and accusations about integrity. As I said before, you can call us wrong. You can call me a fool. You cannot call us weasels. Okay, That is just not fair. And I hope we haven't gotten to a place in American public life where everything has to be torn down on an integrity basis just to disagree. You can disagree with this. There is just not a fair basis for saying that we did it in any way that wasn't honest and independent. That's when I get a little worked up. Sorry. Now, I'm sure. Now, going back to the Rosenstein memo uh, concerning his letter to Congress on October 28th. Now, mind you, that was September 28th, a month before he sent the memo to Congress. Concerning his letter to the Congress on October 28, 2016, the director cast his decision as a choice between whether he would speak about the FBI's decision to investigate the newly discovered email messages or conceal it. Conceal is a loaded term that misstates the issue. When federal agents and prosecutors quietly open a criminal investigation, we are not concealing anything. We are simply following the long-standing policy that we refrain from publicizing non-public information. In that context, silence is not concealment. My perspective on these issues is shared by former Attorneys General and Deputy Attorneys General from different eras in both political parties. Judge Lawrence Silberman, who served as Deputy Attorney General under President Ford, wrote that, quote, it is not the Bureau's responsibility to opine on whether a matter should be prosecuted. Silberman believes that the director's performance was so inappropriate for an FBI director that he doubts the Bureau will ever completely recover. Jamie Gorlick, Deputy, Director, Deputy Attorney General under President Clinton, joined with Larry Thompson, Deputy Attorney General under President George W. Bush, to opine that the director had chosen personally to restrike the balance between transparency and fairness, departing from the department's uh, tra traditions. They concluded that the director violated his obligation to preserve, protect, and defend the tradition of the department and the FBI. And then I'm not going to go too much more on this simply because it's more of the same um, of more attorneys general and deputies attor attorneys general speaking about this, but you've got the gist of the argument there. And then he concludes, uh, the um, deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, he concludes, we should reject the departure and return to the traditions. Uh, although the president has the power to remove an FBI director, the decision should not be taken lightly. I agree with the nearly unanimous opinions of former department officials. The way the director handled the conclusion of the email investigation was wrong. As a result, the FBI is unlikely to regain public and congressional trust until it has a director who understands the gravity of the mistakes and pledges never to repeat them. Having refused to admit his errors, the, the, the director cannot be expected to implement necessary corrective actions. So that was the memorandum from the uh, Assistant Attorney General to the Attorney General, uh, Jeff Sessions. So Rosenstein sent the memo to Jeff Sessions, who sent the recommendation to President Trump, who then notified the FBI and then sent out the press statement. That's what happened earlier this week. So now, as we take a look here, the letter to Congress on October 28th. Now, keep in mind, this is right when we were in the throes of the presidential election. And there comes James Comey right back to act as a spoiler for Hillary Clinton. And here is what Hillary Clinton said of the FBI review. Now, I'm sure that some of you may have heard about a letter that the FBI director uh, sent out yesterday. Well, if you're like me, you probably have a few questions about it. It is pretty strange. It's pretty strange to put something like that out with such little information right before an election. In fact, in fact, it's not just strange, 
It's unprecedented and it is deeply troubling because <laughs> voters deserve to get full and complete facts. And so we've called on Director Comey to explain everything right away, put it all out on the table, right? Now, of course, Donald Trump is already making up lies about this. He is doing his best to confuse, mislead, and discourage the American people. I think it's time for Donald Trump to stop fear-mongering, to stop disgracing himself, to stop... So, the gist of that is the fact that Hillary's saying, well, bring it all out. Let's see what you've got. Um, two days before the election, call me. We've got nothing. But that still resonated in the minds of voters. And even on election evening, uh, at the time most of the polls are closing, here is what Nancy Pelosi had to say about uh, James Comey's uh, little escapade the week, uh, two weeks before the election. When uh, the director of the FBI, Mr. Comey, uh, released that letter two Fridays ago, he became the leading Republican political operative in the country, wittingly or unwittingly. Wittingly or unwittingly, what he did was wrong. But we don't agonize, we organize. And so under the leadership of our chairman, we've been out there fighting every fight. Uh, but we can see very clearly uh, that, and um, I think most people would have agreed, uh, the success, uh, the uh, opportunity to win the House was predicated on a big victory for Mrs. Clinton. When her numbers narrowed, uh, so did that prospect for the House and for the Senate. What I said was, left to our own devices, I thought that uh, we could win 20 seats, uh, but that we had prospects for something greater, uh, depending on what happened in the presidential race. Uh, and that was the path we were on until uh, Director Comey's unfortunate uh, actions that he took, that he has now backed off, but a little late. We'll see if it's out of reach tonight, but he certainly has made it um, uh, more of, of an obstacle. But uh, we hope to overcome it. But it's it's difficult. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. It's difficult to overcome that. We don't. Uh, uh, you you have to understand that he made those comments in an atmosphere where Republicans. I saw one survey that said 77, 70 percent of Republicans believed uh, that Donald Trump would win the presidency if the election were not rigged. So this is like a Molotov cocktail just thrown into a very explosive arena. Shouldn't have done that. Regardless of the impact on the election, in terms of but what the impact is on our democratic institutions. You took an Who else was complaining about the election results? And granted, Nancy Pelosi did not know what the results were at the time she made that statement. Uh, but that's what, where the blame game came out. Rosie O'Donnell came out on the 20th of December with two tweets. Tweet number one. Why hasn't Comey been fired or arrested? Tweet number two from Rosie O'Donnell. Fire Comey. Rosie O'Donnell wanted James Comey fired. Rosie O'Donnell is a partisan Democrat. At least we know that. So why hasn't Comey been fired? Well, he has now. Um, it didn't let up there. It continued on and on. Now, I'll also mention that at the time that... that uh, the second email investigation was announced. Comey also mentioned that there were people tied with the uh, Trump campaign that were also being under investigation. And later, it, we even found out more, uh, March 20th, when Elise Stefanik, a Republican from New York, uh, the youngest member of Congress, age 32, uh, she was questioning the FBI director 
and she lured Comey into a trap and got him to admit that a counterintelligence investigation into the Russia-Trump connection started back in July of 2016. Uh, Comey tripped up, and you know Comey was supposed to have alerted Congress. He never did. March 20th, the mask came off, and you know Comey was uh, then pretty much having to notify. You know, Congress that yes, the Trump team is under investigation. We never heard about an FBI Trump investigation other than that brief mention uh, back in um, October until March 20th. And then in his statement of, of stating why he's being relieved that Comey's notified the president three times that he's not under investigation, something's not adding up here. Could it be that Comey was acting as an agent on behalf of? former President Barack Obama. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know what the truth is because I don't know what the, uh, you know what the evidence is for or against. I'm leaving the possibility open. But there's a lot more to what's going on. But keep this in mind. Comey has angered the Republicans. Comey has angered the Democrats. Comey has angered Congress. Comey should have been fired. He was just the wrong man for the job, and he let the press get to his head. He, he became famous, and he let that get to his head, and that, I think, clouded his uh, skills as an FBI agent. Not just the director, but as a field agent as well. So now, Democrats, of course, they jump on board. Earlier this month, May 3rd, here's what they have to say about uh, Comey on the Clinton and Trump probes. You took an enormous gamble. The gamble was that there was something there that would invalidate uh, her candidacy, and there wasn't. So one has to look at that action and say, did it affect the campaign? And I think most people who have looked at this say, yes, it did affect the campaign. Why would he do it? And was there any conflict among your staff? People saying do it, people saying don't do it, as has been reported? No, there was a great debate. I have a fabulous staff at all levels, and one of my junior lawyers said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president? And I said, thank you for raising that, not for a moment because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent institution in America. I can't consider for a second whose political fortunes will be affected in what way. We have to ask ourselves, what is the right thing to do, and then do that thing? I'm very proud of the way we debated it, and at the end of the day, everyone on my team agreed, we have to tell Congress that we are restarting this in a hugely significant way. Was it appropriate for you to comment on one investigation repeatedly not say anything about the other? I think so. Can I explain, Senator? Uh, department, the guy only has so much time. Okay, I'll be quick. The department, is, I think I treated both investigations consistently under the same principles. People forget, we would not confirm the existence of the Hillary Clinton email investigation until three months after it began, even though it began with a public referral and the candidate herself talked about it. In October, of 2015, we confirmed it existed and then said not another word, not a peep about until, it until, until we were finished. Until the critical time possible, a couple weeks before the election. And I think there are other things involved in that election, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that. But there was no question uh, that that had a great effect. Historians can debate what kind of an effect it was. But you, uh, you did do it. Uh, the, uh, in October, the FBI was investigating the Trump campaign's connection to Russia. You sent a letter informing the Senate and House that you were reviewing additional emails that could be relevant to this, but both investigations were open, but you still only commented on one. I commented, as I explained earlier, on October 28th in a letter that I sent to the chair and rankings of the oversight committees that we were taking additional steps in the Clinton email investigation because I had testified under oath repeatedly that we were done, that we were finished there. 
With respect to the Russia investigation, we treated it like we did with the Clinton investigation. We didn't say a word about it until months into it, and then the only thing we've confirmed so far about this is the same thing with the Clinton investigation, that we are investigating. And I would expect we're not going to say another peep about it until we're done. And I don't know what will be said when we're done, but that's the way we handled the Clinton investigation as well. The new so during that hearing, one other thing happened. The director came out and made another stupid statement over a certain number of emails, and I can't exactly, uh, I don't have the documentation in front of me, I cannot remember exactly how many uh, he specified, just something didn't add up. And once again, the Federal Bureau of Investigation are covering the director. And I say covering, meaning that they had to go out and, and send out a memo to members of Congress correcting the record, showing exactly what uh, they were looking at for a certain number of emails that the director once again had misspoke. I had posted on Facebook on May 9th uh, after I heard about Director Comey's firing. If you're the director of the FBI and you don't know you are getting fired, you probably need to be fired. What James Comey should have done when he found himself getting into a hole he should have done the right thing and offered his resignation. There was no easy way out about this. So right now we have uh, acting FBI Director Anthony McCabe, but McCabe also has um, a not so good reputation, especially considering his wife had taken money from uh, Terry McAuliffe, who is currently the governor of Virginia and a partisan Democrat in front of the Clintons. So McCabe is just a placeholder. Uh, I don't think there's really any effort to get rid of McCabe until another director can be found. That's going to be tough, but I know that they're probably looking that over. Um, but this is what it's come down to. Republicans and Democrats should both be happy. They really should. And instead, we got the Democrats are opposing this and making it sound like it's Nixonian because it was President Trump who fired Comey when Rosie O'Donnell even asked for Comey to be fired back in December. So what did our Vice President Mike Pence have to say? And I'm very confident that the president uh, will go through a process and he will choose an individual who will be able to lead the FBI, not only back to credibility, to restore the trust and confidence of the American people, but lead the FBI to even greater heights to ensure uh, the, that it does its job enforcing our laws and protecting our Sir, Sir, do you have a word? Do you say that those who have drawn parallels to the Nixon administration? Why, why is now the right time? This was the right decision at the right time. Well, why is now the right time? So where do we go from here? A new director and a new legacy. That will all be forthcoming. We're going to leave you with The Untouchables with I Spy. Jerry's got a message for you. For Dallas Pearson, producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching more Star Oasis. Reminding you that there's only 227 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. See you next week.